My name is Sam Vaknin and I am a columnist in Brussels Morning. And today we are going to discuss the limitations of power and maybe nuclear proliferation as a solution to world peace. <laughs> Very counterintuitive. The late Henry Kissinger would have said that the age of idealistic Wilsonianism is over. America's values, norms and mores are now in fierce competition with alternative value systems. Its misconduct in the past few decades and the decay of its democracy have robbed the United States of its moral authority. In a multipolar world, we are back to the balance of powers way of handling international affairs. The limitations of the military political might of any single polity are now painfully clear in multiple locations, in the Middle East, in Taiwan, in Ukraine, to name but a few. In the wake of World War II, the overwhelming predominance of the United States in every realm of life resulted in peace, however tense and precarious, throughout the globe. In this post-coming, in this coming post-American century, conflict is far more likely as coalitions form and reassemble on the fly in order to counter threats and aggression and to prevent the ascendance of any single country. Ironically, the only guarantor of world peace, or at least of the containment of conventional warfare, is nuclear proliferation. If all state actors of the world were to possess atomic weapons, fighting would be unlikely to escalate beyond certain limits. Of course, proliferation poses the risk of non-state actors gaining access to these doomsday weapons. This should be the focus of international treaties, coupled with vigorous and rigorous enforcement mechanisms. But let us study the conflict, the nascent conflict of the 21st century, China versus the United States. A particular case in point is the declining power of the United States versus the ascendant one, China. In the 18th century, Europe's powers shifted their mercantilist and geopolitical attentions from the Americas to the Pacific to the East. It is ironic that 250 years or so later, it is the Americas, from the United States to Brazil, which is withdrawing, which are withdrawing from an anemic Europe to a resurging India, China, and Japan. And this tilt is not as new as it sounds. It started in the 1860s, when the United States overtook Great Britain as the largest economy on Earth. The first wave of globalization lasted till the Great War in 1914 and had swept the globe encompassing reluctant China, a reluctant China, and a reluctant Japan. It took two European world wars to disrupt the natural gravitation of the United States towards its largest trading partners and potential competitors in the Far East. But history is now resuming its ineluctable course. The United States' manifest destiny lies between Melbourne and Beijing, not between Kiev in London. In the early years of the 21st century, European intellectuals yearned for the mutually exclusive, an America contained and a regime changed Iraq, for example. The Chinese are more pragmatic, though bound by what is left of their Marxism, they still ascribe American behavior to the irreconcilable contradictions inherent in capitalism. The United States is impelled by its economy and values to world dominion, claimed in March 2003, an analysis titled American Empire Steps Up Fourth Expansion in the Communist Party's mouthpiece, People's Daily. Expansionism is an eternal theme in American history, a main line running through its foreign policy, said the article. The contemporary United States is actually a land-based empire comprising the territorial fruits of previous armed conflicts with its neighbors and foes, often one and the same. The global spread of American influence through its cultural, political, through its culture, political alliances, science, and multinational, is merely an extrapolation of a trend two centuries in the making. How did an initially small country across a vast ocean 
succeed to thus transform itself into a global power. The paper, the Chinese paper, attributes America's success to its political stability, neglecting to mention its pluralism and multi-party system, the sources of the said endurance. But then, in an interesting departure from the official party line, the article praises the United States for scientific and technological innovations and new achievements in economic development. Somewhat tautologically, it also credits America's status as an empire to its external expansions. The rest of the article is, alas, no better reasoned, nor better informed. American pilgrims were forced westward because they found there was neither tile over their heads nor a speck of land under their feet in the East Coast. There was a quote. But the emphasis are of interest, not the shoddy workmanship in the article. The article, which I remind you is Chinese and probably reflects the official position of the Communist Chinese Party, the article clearly identifies America's capitalistic economy and its liberal, pluralistic, religious and democratic values as its competitive mainstays and founts of strength. U.S. unique commercial expansion spirit combined with the Puritan's concept of mission are its fortes, gushes the anonymous author. The paper distinguishes four phases of distension. First, I'm quoting, first continental expansion stage, second overseas expans expansion stage, third the stage of global contention for hegemony, and fourth the stage of world domination. The second, third and fourth are mainly economic, cultural and military. In an echo of, of defunct Soviet and Euro-left conspiracy theories, the paper insists that expansion was triggered by commercial capital. <clears throat> this capital, better known in the West as the military-industrial complex, also, says the paper, determines US foreign policy. And so the American empire is closer to the commercially driven British empire than to the militarily propelled Roman empire. Actually, the author thinks aloud, isn't America's reign merely the successor of Britain's? Wasn't it John Locke, a British philosopher, who said that expansion, a natural right, responds to domestic needs? Wasn't it Benjamin Franklin who claimed that the United States must constantly acquire new land to open up living space, the forerunner of the infamous German Lebensraum? The author quotes James Jerome Hill, the American railway magnate, as exclaiming during the US-Spanish War that if you review the commercial history, you will discover anyone who controls Oriental trade will get hold of global wealth. And thus, US expansion was concerned mainly with, quote, protecting American commercial monopoly or advantageous position. America entered the First World War only when its free trade position was challenged, opines the red top. American moral values are designed to serve commercial capital, insists the article. This blending of the spiritual with the pecuniary is very disorienting. A quote, even the Americans themselves find it hard to distinguish which matter is expanding national interests under the banner of enforcing justice on behalf of heaven, and which is propagating their ideology and concept of value on the plea of national interests. The paper mentions a conviction held by most Americans that their system and values are the best things in human society and history. Moreover, Americans are missionaries with a manifest destiny. They're exceptional and the duty and obligation to help other countries and nations and to serve as the beacon lighting up the way for the development of other countries and nations. It's kind of a white man's burden, transmogrified. If all else fails, it feels justified to force its best things on other countries by the method of crusades, says the article. So this is a patently non-orthodox, non-Marxist interpretation of history and of the role of the United States the prime specimen of capitalism in it. Economy, admits the author, plays only one part in America's ascendance. Tribute must be given to its values as well. And this view of the United States at the height of an international crisis, pitting China against it, 
is nothing if not revolutionary. American history is recast as an inevitable progression of concentric circles. At first, the United States acted as a classic colonial power, vying for real estate first with Spain and in Latin America and later with the Soviet Union all over the world. The Marshall Plan was a ploy to make Europe dependent on U.S. largesse, suggests the article. The old continent, sneers the paper, is nothing more than a U.S. little partner. Now with the demise of the USSR, bemoans the columnist, the United States exhibits rising hegemonic airs and does whatever it pleased, concurrently twisting economic, cultural and military arms. Inevitably, and especially after September 11, calls for an, for an American new empire are on the rise. Iraq, says the article, was chosen as the first target for this new round of expansion. But the expansionist drive has become self-defeating. Only when the United States refrains from taking the road of pursuing global empire can it avoid terrorist bombs or other forms of attacks befalling on its territory, concludes the opinion piece. What is China up to? Were these and similar articles a signal encrypted in the best Cold War tradition? Another commentary published a few days later may contain the public key. It is, titled, it is titled The Paradox of American Power. The author quotes at length from The Paradox of American Power, Why the World's Only Superpower Cannot Go It Alone, written by Joseph Nye, the dean of, at the time of the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, and a former assistant secretary of defense. And this is what Nye had to say. Hard power works through coercion, using military sticks and economic carrots to get others to do our will. Soft power works through attraction. Our attractiveness rests on our culture, our political values and our policies by taking into account the interests of others. As it summarizes Nye's teachings, the tone of the piece is avuncular and conciliatory, not enraged or patronizing. The article says, in today's world, the United States is no doubt in an adv advantageous position with its hard power. But power politics always invite resentment and the paradox of American power is that the stronger the nation grows, the weaker its influence becomes. As the saying goes, a danger to oneself results from an excess of power and an accumulation of misfortune stems from lavish, uh, from lavish praises and favors. He whose power grows to such a swelling state that he strikes anybody he wants to and turns a deaf ear to others' advice will unavoidably put himself in a straitened circumstance someday. When one indulges its, oneself in wars of aggression under the pretext of self-security, will possibly get in return more factors of insecurity. Military forces cannot fundamentally solve problems and war benefits no one, including the starter of the war. Nor are these views the preserve of the arthritic upper echelons of the precariously balanced Chinese Communist Party. In the same month, in an interview he granted to Xinhua, the Chinese news, the Chinese news agency, Shen Xihu, chief of the Division of International Strategy of the Institute of World Economics and Politics, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, reiterated his conviction that the United States aims to create a unipolar world through the Iraq issue. Mirroring the People's Daily, he did not think that the looming Iraq war can be entirely explained as a dispute on oil or economic interests. The war was, he thought, about the future model of international order, a multipolar and democratic one, or the US strategic goal of a unipolar world. China has been encouraged by dissent in the West. It shows the multipolar international community is an inevitable momentum of history. Why this sudden flurry of historiosophic ruminations? According to Stratford, the strategic forecasting consultancy, for Beijing, the only way to stymie the fourth phase is through promoting multilateralism. Barring that, China must be prepared to confront the United States in the future and U.S. history can give some guidance. 
And so Beijing continues to focus on the concept of multilateralism and the legitimacy of the United Nations as the best way to slow or even disrupt U.S. expansionism. At the same time, Beijing is preparing to face a future confrontation with the United States if necessary. End quote. When its economy matures, China wants to become another United States. It has started emulating America two decades, uh, four decades ago. It has never ceased. Recent steps include painful privatization, restructuring of the banking system, clamping down on corruption and bad governance, paring down the central bureaucracy, revamping the military and security apparatus, and creating mechanisms for smooth political transitions. China sent a man to the moon. It invests heavily in basic science and research and development. It is moving gradually up the manufacturing food chain to higher value-added industries. It is a quintessential leapfrogger, much of its cadre moving straight from the rustic to the plastic, computers, cellular phones, wireless and the like. Ironically, China could never have made it even this far without its ostensible foe. Thousands of bright Chinese students train in the United States. American technologies, management, knowledge, capital, and marketing permeate Beijing's economic fabric. Bilateral trade is flourishing. China enjoys the biggest share of the world's, in large part, American foreign direct investment flows. Should the United States disintegrate tomorrow, China would assuredly follow.